Miserable comforters are ye all, Job said to them. Ye believe that one might plead with God as a man pleadeth with his neighbor. I cannot find one wise man among you. Where, then, neighbors, shall wisdom be found? And where lieth the place of understanding? I, John Brown, say to you that it is just as the Bible shows us the fear of the Lord. That is wisdom. And to depart from evil, that is understanding. Well, neighbors, there you have it, my answer to your charges against me. Now shall I tell thee the meaning of the story of Job. Shall I again compare us here in this sanctuary today to Job, a man of principle, or shall I instead compare us to his friends and neighbors, to Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, whose hypocrisy kindled the wrath of the Lord against them? Which of these ancients resembles us more? For look, ye have counseled me exactly as Job's wife counseled him. Ye have told me to forsake my integrity and curse God. I say to you, miserable comforters, physicians of no value, I tell thee here and now that I and my family shall continue as before to fear the Lord and to depart from evil. You, my good neighbors, you may do as you wish. Predictably, with a few changes, Father went straight back to work on the Underground Railroad. In his mind, all our white neighbors were now cowards and hypocrites. The most significant change was in cutting Mr. Wilkinson out of the operation. Thenceforth, cargo from the south would have to be shipped north Elba via an agent named Reuben Shiloh in care of a Mrs. Ebenezer Rankin. Reuben Shiloh was, in fact, father himself, a pseudonym. Now, Mr. Wilkinson, I believed, somewhat resented being cut away from the operation not out of any love for the Negro or some deep desire to help destroy slavery, but because his work on the railroad made it significantly easier for him to view himself as a man who acted kindly towards people he regarded as his inferiors. Soon after, he joined, unbeknownst to us, with our known enemies, with the slave catchers and bounty hunters, with the folks in the region who regarded us as fanatical troublemakers, and with the marshal from Albany, whose pursuit of the Virginia couple had continued throughout the summer. Meanwhile, we were moving regular shipments of human cargo between Long Lake and North Elba, and due to the rising vigilance of the authorities and the greater presence of slave catchers, our cargo was increasing significantly in volume and degree of risk. Twice we were accosted by law officers, but on both occasions our wagon was empty, and after suffering a brief and surly interrogation we were allowed to continue. Nonetheless, we were ready for the worst, although we weren't actually pursued at any time and weren't obliged to fire our weapons. There was always the danger of betrayal and discovery. People would look up from their work in the fields and stare at us as we passed by or peer out the windows of the bedrooms late in the night when the loud rattle of the wagon disturbed their sleep. Those people must have known who we were and what we were up to. Our operation, however, was narrow, secretive, and private cut off from the communities that surrounded us, cut off even from the rest of the anti-slavery movement. It was as if our little four-man operation were the entire anti-slavery program for America. We lost sight of the larger picture because we were obliged to respond constantly and quickly, day in and out, to the immediate needs of desperate people who had entrusted their lives to us. We operated without reconnoiter and in the absence of intelligence. Thus we were not prepared 
for the reappearance one hot August afternoon of Marshal Saunders. He arrived in the company of a pair of deputies bearing testimony from Mr. Wilkinson, who had accused Father and me and two unnamed Negroes, presently residing in the vicinity of North Elba, of having aided and abetted the escape of the indicted murderers James and Emma Cannon of Richmond, Virginia. The officers came up on us shortly after we had returned from a two-night run to Port Kent with four Maryland Negroes. We were standing outside the house by the water trough, stripped to our waists, washing ourselves. Father looked up at the three men who sat relaxed and open-faced on their horses as if they meant us no harm. Marshal Saunders got straight to the point. Mr. Brown, I have not come here to charge you and your son with anything. I'm here peaceable, but I do need to know the names of the two colored men who helped you carry the cannons through here. It wasn't but a month ago, he said with a slow smile. You no doubt recall their names. If we helped anyone named Cannon, I don't recall that we did. But if we did, then my son and I did it alone. Wilkinson is a liar. Marshal Saunders said, I'm going to assume, Mr. Brown, that you and your son here didn't have no notion that the coloreds from Virginia was murderers, all right? Your Negro associates, however, probably knew better. They have their little secrets that they keep from us he said sourly. His aim was to cut a deal with our friends, the same deal he said that he was cutting with us. If they could give him some small help in locating the cannons, he wouldn't press charges against anyone up here in North Elba. You understand what I'm telling you, Mr. Brown? The father stared up at the man in silence. The horses shifted their weight, sweating under the sun, Certainly I understand, he finally said, but I will not help you, sir. My son and I, if indeed we did help some poor Negro slaves escape from some southern slave master, then we did so on our own. The burden of proof lay with the marshal, father pointed out, and he believed that giving a stranger in a strange land a ride in your wagon was not yet illegal in the state of New York. The father said, You don't know who you are looking for, except on Mr. Wilkinson's perjured say-so, and I can't help you, and if I could, I'd tell you frankly, sir, I wouldn't. Find your Negroes on your own, he snapped, and he turned and walked towards the house. It could all unravel on you, Brown. The marshal called after. I might bring Wilkinson himself up here so he can identify the two niggers for me, and when it comes to saving their own dusky skins, who knows what them fellows will say then. Father wheeled and glared at him. Do as you wish. Bring Satan up from hell if you like and have him pick a pair of Negroes from the crowd for you. I'll not help with work like this. There followed then a rapid succession of events, and it seemed at the time that there was nothing we could do to stop or deflect them. That same evening, Father bore us the news that when Marshal Saunders had earlier interrogated us, he had not told us that he had brought Mr. Wilkinson with him and had kept the man hidden down a road a ways from the farm. The old man had learned from the folks in Timbuktu that the Marshal and his deputies had gathered up Mr. Wilkinson from his hiding place, and the four had ridden over to the Negro settlement, where the traitorous villain had identified Lyman Epps and Mr. Fleet as our cohorts. Then, despite Lyman's and Mr. Fleet's insistence that they knew nothing of the whereabouts of the couple wanted for murder, the marshal had placed both men under arrest and had marched them off to Elizabethtown, where, said Father, they were probably, even as he himself spoke, being placed under lock and key. 
as if the two had been returned to the manacles of slavery. This shall not be allowed to stand, Father bellowed. When morning came and Father and I were preparing to leave for Elizabeth Town, who should arrive at our doorstep but dear John and Jason, my beloved brothers? It was a great reunion for us all. With the sudden arrival of John and Jason, a day that turned out to be tumultuous and ultimately tragic, began as a celebration of familial warmth and union. When he informed them of his intention to ride over to Elizabeth Town for the purpose of arranging the release of the Negro men, even if it must be done at gunpoint, he said, John and Jason naturally chose to accompany and support us. We had not planned to stop in Keene, which we reached by noon, but as we passed by the run-down farm owned by Mr. Partridge, father suddenly determined to pull up I believe I have some business with that man, he grimly announced, and pulled into the yard and dismounted. We followed but did not get down from our horses as he crossed the yard, strode across the porch, and rapped loudly on the door. There was a single saddled horse at the porch rail, a bay that I thought I recognized, but could not be sure until the door swung open and I saw Mr. Partridge's long, dark, gloomy face, and behind him glimpsed the grizzled face of the slave catcher, Mr. Billingsley. Billingsley darted into the darkness of the room, but he surely knew that I and probably father had spotted him. This was a dangerous situation, and I jumped down from the wagon and signaled to John and Jason, who dismounted and joined me at the porch steps. "'What do you want here, Brown?' Mr. Partridge said, his voice shaky with fear, as the three of us came to stand behind Father, each with a musket in hand. Father, too, had his gun slung under his right arm. I've come to redeem my clock, Father announced. He reached down into his left pocket and drew out some coins, which he held in front of him until Partridge unthinkingly extended his own palm. Father let the coins trickle into the other man's hand and said, That, sir, is the cost of our food and lodging for one night. You may count it, and then you will hand over my clock. Well, you're crazy, Brown, he said, and he shoved the coins back at Father, groping at the old man's frock coat until he found a loosely opened pocket and dropped them in, whereupon he moved to shut the door. Father kicked the door back hard and shoved Mr. Partridge aside, and there stood Billingsley, who had drawn both his pistols. Everything happened in less than two seconds. I saw Mr. Partridge's wife a ways behind Billingsley, her hands over her mouth, and beyond her was the old woman, her mother, calmly seated by the rear window, knitting. Mr. Partridge, his face tarred and white with fear, turned and grabbed great-grandfather's clock from the fireplace mantel and extended it towards father, a last-chance peace offering. At that instant, Billingsley fired, missing father who stood directly before him, missing everyone, though we did not know it yet, and simultaneously several of us fired our rifles, a reckless, wild thing to do at such a close range with so many innocent people close by, but we were lucky, for no one was struck, except for the one man who deserved it, Billingsley, the slave catcher. I had fired my gun, and I later learned that John had fired his, but I do not know which of us shot Billingsley. Whichever, it was the first time one of us Browns had shot a man. Who knew which of us had shot him, and did it matter? One of John Brown's sons had done the bloody deed, and the day would continue that way, with John Brown and his sons wreaking havoc and spilling blood. Billingsley was down, his pistol scattered across the floor. There was a loud battery of shouts, bellows, commands, and, from the women, high-pitched screams. Only father remained calm. He waited for silence, and when it came, 
The old man, cool and unruffled as a frozen lake, took the clock out of Mr. Partridge's hands. Then he looked down at the bleeding slave catcher who squirmed and writhed on the floor in pain and said, in a clear, steady voice, Mr. Billingsley, this is the second time that you are lucky that we Browns have not killed you. I advise you, sir, to consider another line of business than hunting down escaped slaves. He turned and closed the door behind him and placed the clock into the front of the wagon. Then the old man and John and Jason mounted their horses. I jumped up into the wagon and we rode quickly off to Elizabethtown, where at around four o'clock in the afternoon we drew up before the stately brick courthouse. The jail was behind and below stairs, and we walked directly there. I did not know Father's plan or if he actually had one, but Father was adept at improvisation. So it was perhaps fortuitous when we marched into the jail armed and passably dangerous looking that we ran face first into Mr. Wilkinson. He looked surprised and frightened to see us, naturally. He appeared to have just come in from a hard ride himself. Mr. Wilkinson, Father said, tell me your business here. This here is John Brown, Wilkinson exclaimed to the jailer, who did not appear to care. He's come to break the niggers out of jail. At once, Father placed the mouth of the barrel of his musket next to the ear of Mr. Wilkinson. You're right about that, he said. Jailer, you can march back to the cells with my sons here and uncage the two colored men and bring them forward, if you will be so kind. Otherwise, I will blow this man's brains out. And Mr. Wilkinson whimpered and said that he had nothing to do with their being jailed, that it was all the fault of Marshal Saunders. Then what are you here for? Well, I, I, I come for my own business, he said. You lie, Wilkinson. Jailer, father said. Tell me this man's business here. Now, he cocked the hammer of his gun. Slowly, carefully, the jailer stood. John, Jason, and I all had our guns trained on him. Well, he come in to identify the niggers back there and, and, and sign some papers to it. Marshall said he, he was to do that. Has Mr. Wilkinson so sworn that the men you have locked up for the Marshal are indeed the fellows he says they are? Because I'm here to tell you they are not. Well, no, not, not, not yet he ain't. They just a couple of colored as far as I'm concerned, and I'm holding them for the marshal like he asked till he comes back from Port Kent. With no arrest warrant. Well, uh, yes, sir. Yeah, that's so. Grabbing Wilkinson by his shirt collar, Father drew him to the steel door that led to the cells and said to the jailer, Come along and bring your keys. Mr. Wilkinson here is going to tell you that the men you have locked up are not the men the marshal is seeking. Why, well, sir, I, I can't release them without the marshal say so, the man said, although he was already unlocking the door to the jail. You will do as I say, father said. Uh, yes, sir, I, I believe I will. He said, and he swung open the door, and we all went straight away back to where Mr. Fleet and Lyman awaited us. M Mr. Brown, we are mightily relieved to see you, said Mr. Fleet. Well, th th this ain't legal, you know, the jailer said to Father as we all marched back out to his office. Father still held Mr. Wilkinson by his shirt collar and had his gun tied against the man's ear. Just don't try to stop us, said Father and no harm will come to either of you. He let go of Mr. Wilkinson and lowered his gun, and we did likewise with ours, and with Mr. Fleet and Lyman in the lead, made to leave the jailer's office. 
John was the last to depart, and when he turned to draw the door closed, he told us later he saw the jailer extract a handgun from his desk, and he shot the man. Go! John shouted, and we ran. He pulled a gun! I leapt into the wagon seat and grabbed the reins, and Mr. Fleet and Lyman, their faces filled with fear, jumped into the back. Father, Jason, and John mounted their horses, and we all broke for the road out of town. When the wagon passed the open door of the jail, I looked to my side and saw the jailer come to the door. He had been wounded in his left arm, but he held a revolver in his right, and he aimed carefully and fired once, and then we were gone, the horses pounding up the road heading north out of town. It was not until we had run nearly a mile that I took it into my head to check my passengers, and I saw with dismay that Mr. Fleet had been shot in the chest. Lyman sat ashen-faced and expressionless beside him, looking out at the passing scenery as if he were alone. Oh, Lord, I cried, what have we done? What have we done, Lyman? It ain't we that killed him, Owen. Then Father and John and Jason appeared on horseback beside the wagon, and they looked down and saw what had happened and grew dark with anger and sorrow, especially Father. Bring him on back to Timbuktu where he can be dressed out for a proper burial. I only wish it were the slave catcher who was dead, not the slave. Mr. Fleet was not a slave, Father, I said. We know that, Owen. We know it. But those other fellas don't. He clucked his horse and we made our way back to North Elba. Despite their astonishment and sadness on learning of the death of Mr. Fleet, our family was overjoyed, of course, to see us return to the farm that night uninjured. And Susan wept with relief at the sight of her husband freed from jail. However, their anxiety had been greatly increased that afternoon by a piece of intelligence they had received in our absence from Captain Kiefer. He had sent his eldest son down to warn us that Marshal Saunders had come looking for the cannons in Port Kent, and to inform us that in truth Captain Kiefer had not transported the Negro couple to Canada after all. Further, the two had been surprised in the kitchen of the Quaker's home by the marshal, and the man had promptly arrested the couple and was now transporting them south to Albany, whence they would be returned to Virginia, there to stand trial for the brutal slaying of their master. What? How could that be? Father demanded. He deceived us. The Quaker lied. Good Lord, is there no one on this earth we can trust? Patiently, Mary related to him what the boy had told her. His boat had been forced back by a sudden, dangerous turn in the weather, and by the time Captain Kiefer made a second attempt to take them into Canada, his underground railroad operatives on the border had been notified by Canadian authorities that the couple was wanted in the United States, and they had refused to accept them. Not knowing what else to do with the couple, Kiefer had brought them into his own home and had attempted to hide and protect them there until he could arrange to move them into Canada by some other means. Most of the villagers in Port Kent were soon aware of the presence of the Negro couple and did not object, and consequently Kiefer had grown careless as to their easy coming and going about the place. Thus it was not difficult for the marshal and his deputies to take them by surprise. Father sat heavily down at the table and sighed. I sensed that he was giving something up. John and Jason and I glanced at one another nervously. What now? Everything seems to have come undone, doesn't it, children? Our neighbors have abandoned us. Men have been shot, and now those whom we would assist in their plight have been captured by the enemy and taken off south to be hung, or worse. Oh, I can barely think of it. John says I must return 
to Springfield, father said. In a calm, low voice, he explained that he was needed there to settle some tangled disputes between the woolen buyers and the sheep farmers in Ohio and our main support, Mr. Perkins. It had seemed a bad idea to father at first. Now, now I don't know. Maybe he's right. I had hoped to be needed more here, he said, and he sighed heavily again. I think our Negro friends in Timbuktu, like our white friends here in North Elba, will no longer want to work with us. What think you, Lyman? Lyman looked up from his plate, chewed silently for a moment, and finally said, you know, Mr. Brown, I, I can't speak for them other folks, just for me and, and my wife here, and we're going to do whatever you decide you need us for. You and your boys, you got me out of that jail today, and if it was me instead of poor old Eldon that got killed, and he was the one sitting here tonight eating supper, I know he'd be telling you the same thing. But them other folks over at Timbuktu, they're probably going to want to lay low for a spell, sort of play possum, you know. They got to, Mr. Brown. You can understand that. That's why we got to take more consideration what you people do than than they do over there. It's like we got this here debt that we owe to you and your family, Mr. Brown, and we won't be paying it off. All right, then, Father said. It settled. As fast as it could be said, then, it had been decided. Father, John, and I would return to Springfield. Jason would head back to Ohio, and Lyman and Susan Epps would stay on at the farm with the remainder of the family, tending to the harvest and setting the farm up properly for winter. We had arrived in Boston after nearly a fortnight's stay in Springfield, where Father had made his usual tireless attempt to set things right with his creditors. I loved the city at once, and might well have run off from Father then and there, like the young Ben Franklin fleeing his home to seek his fortune in Philadelphia. Had I a proper trade or some other means of making my living than caring for sheep or homesteading, it was strange to be so young and to be filled already with regret. At the age of twenty-six I viewed my daily life with a nostalgia for a life that I had never led and never would lead. Here in a city amongst a multitude of distractions and competing truths, it was easier not to succumb to the singular force of father's truth. I was stronger here. Isolation bound me the more tightly to the old man's view of things. In the holy war against slavery, father seemed more and more, and especially here in Boston, like a separatist. I found myself growing cross and impatient with him, and the next day nearly quarreled with him. I had been noticing printed advertisements for an address by Mr. William Lloyd Garrison that evening at the Park Street Church. They had been posted all over the city, many of them deliberately torn down and trampled underfoot, it seemed. Boston was no more undivided in those days over the issue of slavery than any other northern city. The white citizens who were for abolition, complete and forever, were a tiny minority, and those who were for slavery, who thought it a positive good, they too were a tiny minority. The vast majority in between just wanted the problem to go away. And while the majority did not exactly approve of the enslavement of Negroes, they deeply resented their white neighbors who had chosen to make an issue of it. Stopped for a moment at a crowded intersection, I suggested to Father that it would be nice if we could hear Garrison speak tonight at the meeting of the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society. He shot me a puzzled, slightly irritated look, and without answering, darted into the cobbled street and strode on ahead of me. I hurried to catch up and said in a loud voice, "'Well, why not? Are we too pure for the liberator, too?' Since my early childhood, Mr. Garrison's sheet 
had come to us on the front lines like a trusted messenger sent from the headquarters of the army waging war against slavery. Father had used that very figure himself, I reminded him. Yes, but you mistook it. I meant it as a criticism of these pacifistic society men and women. They think that we're the corporals and they're the generals. And men like Garrison, all they're interested in is becoming commander-in-chief, so they waste their time and other people's money squabbling amongst themselves while our Negro brethren languish in slavery. Action, 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 Owen. That's what I want. Enough of this talk, talk, talk. Then you won't go with me, I said. Father said, well, yes, I might be willing to hear Mr. Garrison out of curiosity, but he's elected to speak on the Sabbath. May I attend then and report back to you? As you wish. You are not bound by my religion, Owen. Why do I not feel released, Father? I said. He smiled back. I dare not guess. Later that evening, still secretly angry with Father, I headed out by way of Beacon Street to the Park Street Church. Beacon Street ran alongside the wide expanse of the famed Common, with a facing row opposite the patrician homes of many of Boston's elite. As I walked, I kept to that side of the street close by the tall, elegant houses and as far from the darkened Common as possible, for there... Lurking among the shrubs and trees and appearing suddenly out of the darkness to glare and howl at the decorous, well-dressed men and women walking peacefully towards church was the enemy. They were boys, mostly, and young men, idlers and drunkards, brawlers, louts, whoremongers, and common thieves. There were numerous females among them, too, maps and doxies as wild and brutal-looking as their brothers. I could fairly well smell the brandy and beer on the breath of the youths who brayed their negro-hating sentiments. The gang cackled and screeched and sometimes even tossed a rock and then ducked back into the bushes out of sight to be replaced further on by another gang whose drunken members would pick up the chant. "'Nigger lovers,' they hollered. "'You're nigger lovers. "'You're niggers yourself. "'Ugly black niggers. "'Ugly black niggers.' And so on. Stupidly, even idiotically, they ranted until we were walking a kind of gauntlet, it seemed, or proceeding through a maddened, howling mob to our own public hanging, headed not to a place of worship but to a scaffold. How courageous, I thought, were these men and women beside me, many of them elderly, who walked in silence along the sidewalk, that our pale complexions protected us keeping us from being physically attacked by them and possibly even killed, caused me to realize anew that white is as much a color as black. Our flag, our uniform, was our white skin, and while it provoked this attack from our fellow whites, it also shielded us from serious harm. Once inside the church, I realized I had been seriously frightened although it was hard to distinguish fear from anger. I wanted to strike out, to hit and hurt those foul mouths, and it had taken great restraint to appear to ignore them instead of picking up a loose brick or thrown rock and hurling it back or chasing the fellows into the bushes and thrashing them there. Standing there in the foyer, shivering with rage or fear, and tamping down fantasies of violent retribution, I suddenly felt ashamed of myself. Action, action, action was Father's call, but here, in this serene context, action seemed vile, easy, childish. Mr. Garrison's perspective and that of the anti-slavery society as a whole was based on the Quaker philosophy of non-violence, and it was easy to criticize it from afar while gnashing one's teeth over the ongoing injustice of slavery. But here, in the face of the mob, pacifism seemed downright courageous and almost beautiful. 
I was glad that father was not at my side, for although he, like me, probably would not have charged into the common to thrash his tormentors, he surely would have entered the church growling and snarling at the weakness of the society members for not having created a stout and well-armed security force to protect their meetings. Ah, father, how you shame me one minute and anger me the next. How your practical wisdom, which at times borders on a love of violence for its own sake, challenges my intermittent pacifism, which borders on cowardice. Your voice stops me cold and then divides me. One day in one context I am a warrior for Christ. The next day in another context I am one of his meekest lambs. If only I had been able, like so many of my white countrymen, to believe that the fight to end slavery was not my fight, that it was merely one more item in the long list of human failings and society's evils that we must endure, then I surely would have become a happy, undivided man. Even before Mr. Garrison appeared, I rose from my seat and left. In a moment I was back on the street. The howlers were gone, disappeared into the common. Giddy with an unidentifiable excitement, I made my way slowly over the rough, cloddy ground which gradually opened onto a broad, unmowed field. Oddly, I felt myself to be in no danger. I was not being pushed from behind, but rather was being drawn forward as if by some powerful magnetic force. Suddenly I felt free of father, free of the force of his personality and the authority of his mind, free of his rightness. Yes, more than anything else, it was his rightness that so oppressed me in those years. I could in no way honestly or openly oppose it. It exhausted me, humiliated and punished me, and divided me against my true self. Inevitably, his moral correctness, which I could never deny, brought me to heel. It was in my bones and blood to follow him wherever his God led him, for although I did not believe in my father's God, I believed in the principles that my father attributed to him, and so long as the old man did not waver in his loyalty to those principles, I could not waver in my loyalty to the old man. Yet tonight, in this strange sanctuary of darkness, I felt as if I were afloat on stilled black waters. I slipped past a knot of men gathered before a small fire. Ghostly figures stepped forward and silently withdrew, and every third or fourth of them hissed to me or beckoned for me to follow. Were these shadowy figures, these frail gray wraiths and dark spirits, the same demonic figures I had seen earlier? These people hardly seemed capable of raising their voices, much less shrieking obscenities and tossing rocks. But then I saw a band of ruffians, seven or eight of them, boldly approaching me, swigging from a shared bottle and laughing boisterously, they marched straight towards me as if we were on a path and their intent was to force me out of it. They were boys, fifteen or sixteen years old, amusing themselves by banding together and playing the bully to solitaries like me. As they neared me, one of them hollered, Out of our way, you damn bunter, or we'll slice off your prick and make you eat it. And the others laughed. The first of the lads reached forward as if to grasp me by my placket, and I tore his hand away with my right hand and clubbed him in his grinning face with my left, sending him sprawling. At once the gang was upon me like a pack of wolves taking down an elk. They darted in and struck me in the face and belly and groin, kicked at my knees, and although I did some damage to them, they soon had me crouched over, and in seconds with several hard, well-placed kicks to my ankles, they had me on the ground, face down. They said not a word to me or to each other, and business-like went straight to work as if they wished to murder me. The beating went on for many minutes until I was beyond pain, 
or so encased by it that I could no longer distinguish individual blows. Their boots and fists smacked against my spine and ribs and the back of my head and the meat of my arms and legs, pitching my limp body this way and that, until finally the force of the blows tumbled me off the path into a shallow gully where there was enough bilge and foul-smelling trash that they did not want to pursue me there. For a long while I lay there in the wet filth. I believe I lost consciousness, for the next thing I remember is the broad red face of a white whiskered police officer. Well now, lad, I guess you're not dead after all, he said. It took two policemen to bring me to father at Dr. Howe's house where I was laid out like a corpse on a pallet in our chamber on the third floor. As soon as we were alone, father stripped my torn clothing off and washed me down in placid silence. Finally, when he had me wrapped in a warm blanket and I was drifting toward sleep, he peered down at my face and said, Owen? Tell me now what happened to you tonight. Is it necessary? He answered that he wished only to know how I came to be walking at night through the common when the place was a well-known haunt of hooligans and prostitutes. Your private business is your own business, he said, but I pray that it's not what it looks like. I almost wished that it were. It would have been somehow more natural. But I could not lie to him. There were all kinds of strange, demented people in that place, I said. It's as if the place has been specially set aside for them. When a group of them wished me to step aside and defer to them, I had attacked them. You attacked them? His eyes opened wide. Yes. He reached out and set his hand on my head. You went in there and purposely attacked this gang of Negro-hating hooligans? Yes, it looks that way. It felt that way, too. Didn't you realize, son, that they were capable of stabbing you, of killing you, of simply beating you to death? as they nearly succeeded in doing? Did you not know that, or are you merely that naive? No, I knew. Yet you went in there anyhow. You went after them. Yes. I see you freshly, son. He sat back and looked steadily at me. You have as much of the lion in you as the lamb. In my prayers tonight, I will be thanking God for that, he said and smiled. The next morning was a fine day. It was Sunday, and when Father marched me off to church, I was fuzzy-headed and dizzy and only dimly aware of what we were up to. And before long I did indeed think that I was dreaming, for our reality that morning corresponded uncannily to a nighttime dream that I frequently had in those years. Father and I were the only white people in a crowd of well-dressed Negroes. As we moved through the large gathering, they parted for us and nodded respectfully, some of the men touching the brims of their hats, the women politely averting their gazes, the children looking at us with surprised eyes, lovely people of all the many Negro shades. It was as if every tribe of Africa were represented there. Soon the crowd closed around Father and filled in between us, and I found myself cut off from him, falling further and further back, and suddenly I became afraid not so much of the Negroes who surrounded me as of being separated from Father. Like a small child, I cried out to him, Father, wait! At that, the crowd seemed to part again and to open up a corridor between us. Father slowly turned and peered at me. Then 
Impatiently waving me on, he resumed walking up the broad steps of a small brick church and disappeared from my view into the darkness of the sanctuary.